So let's talk about your crate that uses Transpool, which is Cargo Semverchak, right? Uh, tell us a bit more about it. Yeah, the idea behind the crate is that semantic versioning is something that is very difficult to get right in, in uh, Rust. And at the same time, it's very painful when it goes wrong because it's unfortunate for maintainers. They now have to scramble and, and deal with this fire drill that sort of was unscheduled and just generally stressful as a situation. And on the other hand, everyone that is using their crate also has an unscheduled fire drill because now their projects are broken and they're failing to compile and they have to pin to a lower version and it's just not great. It's especially bad when you have a crate that has a lot of downstream consumers because now that, that work is duplicated and amplified, you know, times a hundred or times a thousand, you know, for every one of its its dependencies, whether or not they realize that they were depending on that project, right? Because transitive dependencies are also affected. And so cargo server checks is a is an attempt to make the situation better, not really by trying to take any sort of control away from maintainers, but more by detecting common issues and then warning maintainers about what might happen if they go forward with the publish. So if you've ever tried to run Cargo Publish in a repository that has some uncommitted changes, you might have noticed that Cargo Publish will say, hey, I think you have some uncommitted changes. If you're sure you want to go forward, pass the, the flag to override it and you can you can still publish, but I'm warning you so that you didn't say you didn't know what was happening. I kind of think of Cargo Sandbox Checks as a similar sort of tool. So it's designed so that you can run Cargo Sandbox Checks right before you run Cargo Publish. And Cargo Sandbox Checks will say, hey, I found these things that don't seem in line with the kind of version bump that you're attempting to publish. But of course, if you think that's completely right to, to do, by all means, go ahead and publish, right? It's just you never want to be on the hook for dealing with the fallout of an issue that a tool could have warned you ahead of time for and that had you known, you might have changed your mind and, and done something different. So that's that's kind of the mindset that I, I have about it, that you know, a rest station, I said this on, on social media a few weeks ago, a rest station is, is someone who really hates being told, yes, everything's fine in a situation where they might regret it later. Absolutely, yes. Uh, yeah, as a user who like run a cargo update on their on their project and uh, so something breaking i i really appreciate uh, uh, the effort you're putting into cargo sember check i think it's uh, it's a great tool like uh, I'll, I'll try to like the for example to, to explain it to to other to users the to listeners like for example say that you have a public method and uh, like i don't know you you rename it or you add another field to it, you run cargo semver check and it tells you, oh, uh, this method was there was here before, but now it's uh, it's no longer here. So if you if you want to do a cargo publish, make sure to do a breaking change, yes. And uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's great because uh it's one of those things when you say, Oh yeah, uh, you just need to be uh, like focused and review everything you've done uh, but like in reality everyone can have a bad day and uh, then you, you need to yank the version so it, it's a it's a great tool and I think I believe that also there is a some effort to integrate it into cargo right that's right um the cargo team has been incredibly helpful with cargo sample checks and the plan is to make it run by default before cargo publish so exactly like the the uncommitted changes check uh there's obviously some some work remaining to to be done around that uh most of the work is just adding more lints so that we can be more confident in in its assessment uh eliminating some of the the remaining uh false positives especially around things like doc hidden where the you know what is public api and what is not public api has some tricky edge cases and then just stabilizing the API because Rust is very, very committed to, to stability. And so the CLI and the API that the tool offers need to be in a very stable sort of place so that other people can build additional tooling on top of this. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, so to understand a bit how uh, Cargo Semver check works under the hood, uh, I would like to ask you how 
is this tool different from previous attempts to solve this problem in the Rust ecosystem? Absolutely. Um, the interesting thing is that the thing that Cargo Semver Checks does differently or that's new about it is not usually the, the first thing that comes to mind. There are other tools built previously like Semverver that could also detect breaking changes correctly and that could point out the, the problematic code and, and things like that. The issue with a lot of those tools was not one of low performance or of inability to detect breaking changes. It was the cost of maintenance, the sort of day-to-day -day costs to keep the lights on, to keep the tool working, you know, to keep it working as well tomorrow as it was yesterday. And the reason that cost is so high is because all of the data sources that uh, these sorts of tools need to use to detect breaking changes are completely unstable. Uh, there, there are sort of two, two different approaches to, to take here. One is reach directly into Rust C APIs, which change, I mean, almost quite literally day to day. Or to use Rust doc JSON, which is slightly more stable, but not really a lot more stable. It's it's more stable in the sense of it only breaks on average once every minor new Rust version, right? So roughly call it once a month or once every every six weeks. And so a lot of these prior projects ended up being deprecated, not because they couldn't get the job done, but because a substantial fraction, I mean, you can count PRs and it's something like 20 or 30% of all of their PRs were just update to the newer version of things, update to the newer version of things, update to the newer version of things, right? So that's an unsustainable level of effort just to keep the lights on without adding any sort of new functionality, without fixing existing bugs, just day-to-day, -day, you know, minimum viable, keep everything going uh, kind of work. So the key innovation in Cargo Sanford Checks is not one of functionality or performance, it's that we have massively reduced the amount of day-to-day -day maintenance that is necessary. And the way that we have done this is by making it so that the business logic of detecting breaking changes is completely separate from how we access that data to, to evaluate whether there was a breaking change. And the wildcard factor, you know, the, our ace in, in upper sleeve here is Trustful. The way that this works is Trustful sits in between the data source, which in our case is Rustadog JSON and the business logic of Semverlints, which are just written as queries over uh, a data model that is completely abstract. So it's not bound to, this is what the specific shape of the JSON document that we're looking at is. Can you explain a bit what's uh, Rustdoc JSON? Yeah, absolutely. So Rustdoc is a Rust tool that is built into, that, that ships together with the, the Rust tool chain that is able to generate uh, documentation using compiler APIs. So it, it's what powers DocsRS, for example. Uh, DocsRS uh, is using HTML output uh, for the crate. So it shows you know, all of the APIs as a web page. It also has an unstable mode of generating that same documentation as JSON. And uh, that's unstable because the Rust language itself is also growing, right? So it would be kind of terrible if we said this format is Pinned it down forever, and now there is no more adding, you know, new Rust functionality because we can't, you know, add it anywhere to to this format. Um, so of course, there's a little bit of tension here, right? If we worked harder towards stabilizing Rust.json, it will make it harder to evolve the Rust language. If we made it easy to evolve the Rust language, which I think we is something that we do want to do, that means that Rust doc JSON is less stable and there are more changes that we need to account for. And so building this kind of tooling becomes a little bit more difficult. So that's that's really where Cargo Semver Checks uh, ended up being a little bit new there. I see. So basically, uh, the Rust doc.json file is a JSON file that summarizes what you see on docs RS. So it says your public methods, your public uh, modules, structs, and so on. So you built uh, an adapter for Trustful to query this uh, Rustdoc JSON, and even if, like you, you wrote also queries that uh, each query corresponds to a, a rule. So you said, uh, yeah, like we said, if the name of the method changes, then it's a, it's a breaking change, 
And so even if the rust.json format changes, you just need to edit the Rustful adapter, but the queries stays the same, right? Right, exactly. And so what previously was a sort of quadratic complexity problem because one needed to update every query for every bit of format change now is a linear problem because we have queries and the adapter and we just update the adapter and the queries become remain blissfully ignorant of any sort of format changes. So the queries are written quite literally at a level of if there was a public function in your public API in the previous version, try to uh, uh, find cases where there isn't that same, you know, that same public function does not exist in the public API of the new version. And this kind of query written at this level has no, you know, no ability to perceive the underlying format. And so is completely insensitive to the changes because the changes to Rust stock JSON are not, you know, Rust has functions today and doesn't have them tomorrow, right? That That is not the kind of breaking change that happens in Rust.json. Instead, the kinds of changes are, we renamed this field or we moved this piece of data from here to there. And those are the kinds of things that don't really affect our abstracted sort of view of the world, view of the APIs that we're, we're trying to query. And Trustfall is that level of abstraction that uh, allows us to have this clear separation between how we write these queries and how that data actually gets there and, and gets processed uh, to make all of that work. Awesome. I would like also to do a call, call to action for our listeners. I like, I, I saw the queries of uh, some queries of Trustfall and of uh, Cargo Semver Chucks, and they are I think they are easy to read and easy to write. So if somebody wants to contribute to Carlos M. Verchaks, maybe by adding uh, new, new queries, uh, Predrag is, uh, is an awesome maintainer. I contributed uh, some stuff to Cargo M. Verchaks. So I highly recommend also because uh, like your code can, can be part of Cargo itself one day if, if we had uh, um, a bunch of is there so uh it's awesome um i wanted Absolutely. to ask thank you <laughs> i wanted and, to ask yeah sorry uh, and uh just to sort of further encourage people hopefully uh adding a new check is as simple as just writing one file that just contains the error message to show to people when you know something broken is discovered a trust fall query that describes how to find the thing so that would be find public functions that used to exist and that no longer exist, for example. Uh, obviously not in English in query syntax, but that's something you can prototype in the playground uh, and you get the benefit of uh, autocomplete and, and all of those nice you know, 21st century developer experience uh, kinds of benefits. And these kinds of uh, new lints are added all the time and people with all sorts of levels of experience with Rust and programming have contributed successfully, including folks who are still in college, including you know people super early in their careers. So this is really open to anyone of, of all skill levels. You just need to be willing to you know take a look at how how these things are done or ask questions when something is unclear. Please feel free to ping me, and I'm I'm very happy to help and mentor. Great. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, what are the limitations of this approach by uh, that you using. Uh, Rust.json, if, if there are some limitations, I don't know, I'm thinking about, for example, performance. So like parsing big uh, JSON files, stuff like this. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I want to say that the Rust, the folks working on Rust doc have been incredibly helpful and very open to, to suggestions. We've had a very close collaboration. And so you know, obviously any, any kind of system is, is going to find some friction here and there but they've been very receptive to feedback. And I mean, we're working on, on resolving all of the things that, that we find. So absolutely zero complaints there. I have nothing but, but good things to say. For the most part, uh, obviously performance can always be better. Thankfully, semantic versioning violations are painful enough that even if it takes a few extra seconds to, to sever check your, your crate, that is almost always going to be worth it. You know, it's not running uh, in the C the sort of the hot path of your CI loop, right? It's not necessarily running on every PR, although we're hoping to, to get it there as well. 
So a few extra seconds here and there are not usually a problem. And you know, build caching is helpful. So a lot of this stuff gets gets reused. For a brand new clean build, obviously the build itself takes a few seconds, but that's not specific to Rust doc. That's just Rust in general. And yes, parsing a, a big file can can also take a few seconds. But again, that's that's not really the the biggest issue. Um, the biggest limitation that we that we today have is uh, cargo server checks uh, and Rust stock are a little bit limited in terms of how much they can see uh, items from other crates. So it's quite difficult actually to link uh, one crate to another crate through Rust stock JSON. Uh, and there's some subtlety here around, you know, what if there are multiple versions of the same crate in the same workspace? How do we know which of those versions to point to and then generate that, that new Rust stock file? And how does all of this get interconnected? Fortunately, because Trustfall is in the loop here, once we're able to solve these sort of infrastructural concerns of how do we get the right metadata in the right places in, in all of these Rust stock files, we'll be able to plug all of that data into the Trustfall adapter. And so the queries are going to get that capability for free. So we're not really digging ourselves into any sort of maintenance hole here, uh, but it is a limitation. And so Cargo Semver Checks today is not actually able to Semver Check whether your re-exports from a third-party crate uh, are still adhering to Semver. It just completely does not see those at all. It's as if they don't exist. And so any breaking changes in those will not currently be reported. Uh, and this is sort of in general true of cargo server checks. If cargo server checks finds an issue, odds are it's actually an issue, otherwise it's a bug. If cargo server checks says everything's fine, it's actually possible that it's a false positive because we have 50 plus lints that we already have implemented, but we also know that there are hundreds of lints that we haven't implemented yet. And so that's where that, that call to action of please come and help write us some more lints uh, is super important. Uh, we keep adding those uh, on, you know, in every new release. But obviously, even though we have a lot and the tool can catch a lot of stuff already and it's super useful, there's obviously a lot more stuff that it could do in the future. I see. Uh, so uh, you said that uh, uh, you don't you don't catch if uh, you don't catch violations of other crates. So if your crate re-exports another type, another another crate. So for example, I don't know, you are uh, Axum, for example, a web framework and you re-export HTTP. You don't see if HTTP uh, did a breaking change, but can, can this be solved by uh, running cargo server checks in both crates or? Yes, so uh, if uh, you run cargo server checks on HTTP itself. You'll be able to find uh, breaking changes there and make sure that Semver is adhered to. The part that will not get caught right now is, let's say hypothetically, that Axum were to upgrade from one major version of the HTTP crate to another major version of the HTTP crate. That re-export is now re-exporting a completely new major version, which is in itself a breaking change. And this is something that cargo server checks will not report. So this is a case where the HTTP crate by itself is completely server compliant, but the re-exported crate in Axum has a different major version, which is itself a breaking change because now you know, Rust thinks that the types are not the same types because they come from different major versions of the same crate. And that is not something that cargo server checks today will be able to flag for you. I see. Yeah. I, 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 um... I would say that it's it's great to have the ability to, in your dependencies, have different versions of the same crate, but at the same time it can be painful. Yeah, um, I wanted to to ask you since like uh, Semver violations are uh, your daily job basically, uh, what advices uh, would you give to Rust maintainers in the sense that like what are the most common errors that they do? when releasing new packages? Yeah. The most important thing to remember, I think, is that Semver violations happen to everyone. So don't take it too seriously if if one happens to your crate. You know, there, there are only two kinds of Rust developers out there, the ones that have already gotten unlucky and have published a Semver violation, and the ones that haven't yet gotten unlucky and published a Semver violation. 
this is a tooling problem. It's not a it's not a people problem, right? It's not a sign of lack of skill, a lack of dedication, anything like that. If if something like this happens to slip by and and get published, so don't feel bad about about it if that happens to you. Obviously, use the best tooling at your disposal. Things like Clippy and Cargo Server Checks and and other awesome tooling and and Rust. Uh, all of those things can help you. Uh, but they can't really, you know, guarantee a hundred percent that uh, everything everything ends up, you know, working out, and and that you never publish any bugs, right? No single tool is a hundred percent solution to to anything, right? But between Cargo Clippy and Cargo Server Checks and Cargo Test and and all of these different uh, dev tools, we can do a pretty so solid job of of making sure that those unfortunate accidents don't happen particularly often. The most common server violations that I've seen are the ones where you have situations where there was a guarantee that you weren't realizing that you were making that then gets violated. And this happens in two different ways. One is when you have exhaustive types. So say that you have an enum that is not marked non-exhaustive, adding a new variant is a breaking change because anyone that was using it, say, to pattern match now has to add the new variant, right? Uh, another more sneaky one is that if you have a public struct that has completely public fields, right? So it has no private fields anywhere. Any field addition to that struct is also a breaking change. Even a public field, even a private field, always a breaking change. And so again, you, if you had realized that you were doing this, you could have marked your, your public struct non-exhaustive and that would have saved you some headache down the road. Unfortunately, you know, maybe you didn't do that. And so now adding non-exhaustive is itself a breaking change, as is adding a new private or public field to that struct. And so unfortunately, you're a little you're in a little bit of a tight corner there. And that is itself a little bit of room for further improvements. I would love to have either cargo server checks or another similar tool warn you when you're adding a new public type to your public API to say, hey, maybe you want to make this non-exhaustive because Non-exhaustive now is not a breaking change, but non-exhaustive tomorrow will be. So just make sure that you really meant to make this exhaustive. And we see a similar problem with auto traits as well, where something was send or sync or unwind safe is a is a is a good one that trips up a lot of people. Uh, where your type was send or sync or unwind safe, and you didn't necessarily realize it, and you didn't maybe even mean to make it that, but now changing some internal implementation detail makes it no longer be one of those auto traits. And now that's a breaking change and you're surprised to see it in Cargo Sanford checks. Or worse, you're surprised to wake up and it's on, it's on a GitHub issue one day. <laughs> Can you explain what are uh, auto traits? Absolutely. So uh, Rust has this amazing feature where if your code was uh, safe to use in a multi-threaded environment, uh, this is encoded in the type system via these traits called send and sync. Uh, essentially, they are whether they're saying whether a particular type is safe to be used from more than one thread at the same time or to be passed from one thread to another thread. Now, if you had a type that was previously thread safe and that type is no longer thread safe, this is a major breaking change in every programming language out there. This is not unique to Rust. This is true in Java and C Sharp and, and every other language that I've ever written. But Rust is the only one in which this becomes a failure at compile time rather than something that somebody is dismayed to discover leads to a race condition or a use after free, you know, the hard way in production at 3 a.m. So uh, they have this unfortunate tendency in, in some ways that the compiler makes types, uh, marks types thread safe by automatically implementing these traits, send and sync, if every one of the components of the type, so all of the fields, all of the variants, whatever, uh, are also themselves send and or sync. That also unfortunately means that if you have an implementation detail of an implementation detail of your type that has stopped being thread safe, that sort of propagates through your entire type system end to end. And now you can have a private you know, change in a private type somewhere escalate and break your public API in a completely different file, maybe even in a completely different crate. And now you're you're left in this situation where you've accidentally broken a promise that you've made to your users that 
these types are going to be thread safe and, and safe to use. Now, Rust will warn you about this ahead of time, right? So that's good. It's better than debugging a race condition. It's also unfortunate, though, that you maybe didn't realize that you were making this, this promise to begin with and that you know, a, a tool like Cargo Sandwich Checks can, can at least warn you about what you're going to do so that you can act appropriately rather than uh, finding out about this via compiler error in your crate or, or in someone else's crate later down the line. Yeah, so yeah, Rust uh, shifts uh, the, the issue from runtime to compile time. So for example, if you send, if you, if you send uh, a, a struct which is not read safe among different threads, the compiler will tell you you're doing it wrong. And uh, yeah, this is something I really appreciate about R Rust because like normally in other programming languages, like for example, Java and so on, you need to read the documentation to check if, for example, that hash map is thread safe instead with Rust, you're, uh, you're confident of, more confident of what you're doing. And uh, right. it's amazing, I guess. And as we all know, nobody really reads the documentation in practice. Uh, so it, it's a lot better, in my opinion, that the compiler enforced this, just like the borrow checker, especially because these bugs are incredibly difficult, incredibly painful, incredibly expensive to debug when they happen in production. Uh, if you've never debugged uh, a race condition or a use after free in production, honestly, try to keep it that way. <laughs> it's not fun. Zero out of 10 would not recommend. Absolutely. 